And I think one of the things that people are really concerned about is in the new heavens and the new earth, will I be recognizable? You know, will I be self-aware? Will I know people that I have, have known in, in this life? And I think the great promise of this is that there is, there's a continuity, that there is uh, something of our, our nature and character that is, is restored, glorified, uh, and enhanced. Welcome to this week's Calling Us Into Life, a podcast by Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. Myself and Jack are not stressed at all, we're not running around at all, it's all calm and tranquility. There is lots of central heating and there are no rats running around the farm. <laughs> it's all your imagination. It's like a revelation dream, isn't it, Jack? Just like that. Just Wonderful. like that. Brody, how are you this morning? Are you living the revelation dream, whatever that happens to be? <laughs> Don't know about that. I am fine. I enjoyed the nice sunrise this morning. So Yeah. Looking, looking east, a nice red... Mm -hmm. sunrise through the trees of queen's park mm -hmm. yeah we saw that from outside because it was warmer outside than it was inside so that's just the way we are <laughs> yeah my house my house feels like that as well if you live in a lower cottage flat in glasgow you know that they don't have any insulation <laughs> it's oh. warmer outside than in mm -hmm. <laughs> well we've got plenty of insulation we can loan you if you want it it's just none of it happens to be inside our house <laughs> uh, ian are you roasty toasty in your office this morning yeah <laughs> yeah he heat rises and when you've got your uh office at the top of the house everything rises so um yeah it's cold in the base mars cold in the ground floor and nice and toasty up here nice I, i'm so sorry i'm so sorry for telling you guys that but uh, <laughs> it's nice and toasty here <laughs> so ian we uh, we're nearly there I'd like to say the end is nigh, but I'm not sure that's appropriate <laughs> phraseology for getting close to the end of Revelation. Uh, but you had the pleasure of speaking to us from Revelation 20. So One. What? 20, 21 even, from Revelation 21. I've actually, I'm looking at my notepad here and I've written 20 and connected it in my notepad as I've started <laughs> writing my notes on Sunday. So from Revelation 21, why don't you give us a summary of Revelation 21. Yeah, we're nearly at the end of the world, as they say, um, but there is hope for the future. Uh, so my kind of theme was um, classic Baptist minister three-pointer this week. So I'll give you the three <laughs> points. Um, headline is, there is hope for the future. Um, point one, God will make all things new. Um, and the point I was trying to make about that is, it's not just... Uh, simply a replacement of all things but a transposition of things and mortality will put on immortality so there's a continuity between what we are now and what we shall be though much more glorious point one point two uh, he will be with us we're promised that god's dwelling will be with people so god's eternal desire to be with us will be completed in all its fullness and then thirdly, he will complete what he has done. Um, and, and actually, I kind of pulled out one sort of theme from that, which is just really relates to the end of Revelation 21 about the wealth of the nations being drawn in and the way that God will redeem our human uh, gifts and uh, endeavor. And actually what we do in the here and now uh, resonates into uh, eternity and there's an eternal fruit for our current, um, our, our current work. Um, and then kind of wrapping all of that together, um, we in the present have the privilege of, of making this promise of God's future hope visible in our lives and by our words. I don't know if that's what other people heard, but I think that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> that, that is definitely what you said. <laughs> you, start, <laughs> you started by talking about doom scrolling and some of our kind of obsession with going down to the rabbit trails of negative stories that we come across on the internet and so on. And you also referenced some books. You you had a slide up, a slide? Do we still call them slides? <laughs> you had a you had a slide up with, with we know what you thank mean. you. Um of of some books. I was particularly troubled by the Martin Rees book, Our Final Century, which just, you know, looks like joy itself. Um I wondered if what you're thinking is about why we seem to have 
somewhat of an obsession with negative things why we seem to have a need for drama or or kind of want to sort of surround ourselves often with oh what the bad news is I, I suppose at the kind of um social level that's not always been the case um i think there was great optimism in other generations for what the future would like look like um and then uh, for various reasons, possibly just the two world wars in the 20th century has has kind of scuppered that social optimism that, that many people had in the, in the 19th century. Um, and then just as people have become more aware of the the challenges, the real challenges that exist in our world, um, that has, has led to a lot of people writing about um, the negativity of the future. So I think there are definitely some some real challenges up ahead and the two books that I quoted from um, are both talking about the environment and the challenges that face us as human beings. I mean, we, for the first time in the 20th, 20th century, we had a, an existential threat uh, through nuclear war that we could extinguish life on the planet. So I think there are really kind of good reasons, as it were, for us uh, looking at our human ability um to to be concerned that um we're not actually um able to create utopias for ourselves um but then i think on top of that you know we do have a lot of us this kind of negative spiral so some of these i, I guess even just the resonance with some of the titles of these books is that they just trigger us into these negative views that we can very easily get into about the world around about um and the fact that somebody bought me one of these books from my christmas um, just that has to kind of uh, be factored into this equation as well. What's the tension for Christians then? Uh, certainly, for example, things about environmental disaster and so on. When you want to be a Christian that's really paying attention to these things and concerned about them, but at the same time not being sucked into the kind of narrative that the world would have you believe, which is which is not what Revelation is. If that makes sense, it's a question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a tension in all of this um, because actually our actions as as people who have fallen short of God's glory, people who were intended to be earth keepers and stewards of the, the planet, um, you know, we've, we do fall short of that. And we, we fail in that and we damage our, our environment. Um, and I think that's got to be held in, in a creative tension with the hope that God is renewing all things. Um, but that doesn't mean he's junk, junking all things. So I think we have hope that God can restore. Um, but just as, <clears throat> you know, we look after our bodies and souls, um, even though our bodies and souls are going to be translated, you know, you don't kind of say, Do you know what, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to really allow my soul to kind of languish and just cut in sin and death, you know, for all of my life. I actually, I'm wanting to kind of press into that being renewed. I think that same mentality um needs to get expressed in um in our views on how we engage with society and how we engage with with the planet you know we're not just despondent we're not faithless uh, we believe that god is going to restore it and that's part of god's heart and god's kingdom coming so you know we seek to cooperate with what god is doing and align our lives with with his purposes so i guess if we have a very negative view about the world then uh, one of my kind of comments about that is if you had a sore leg um would you go to the doctor of course you would your body is wasting but you know you want to kind of at least maintain it while you've been given responsibility for it so at the very least um we should be looking after what god has has given us um and i would suggest that's part of our our fundamental calling as human beings is to look after what we've been entrusted with brody do you feel like you're managing to live in that place of tension well I don't know about that. Um, yeah, because I think part of the challenge isn't it of... Um, so there would be some people who kind of like would see the the end of the world as, as destruction. I mean, there's old hymns and, and new worship songs that kind of like talk about kind of like uh, the world fading away or the destruction of the world. And God is, Ian, I, I think rightly, is 
said on, on Sunday and, and even just now, is not going to destroy planet Earth and the cosmos and whatnot, but is going to renew it, transform it. Um, the Latin is transformatio mundi, uh, the transformation of the world, because the paradigm for all this, the, the, the template is the risen Christ, who was risen bodily. Um, there was both continuity and discontinuity with the body that he, he had. And so both for us um, and for the world that we live in, the universe we live in, there'll be that continuity and discontinuity. The tension is, well, if God's going to make everything new, then, you know, why bother? You know, why does it matter if, mm. if the world is destroyed? And that really comes down to, well, actually, um, our actions or inaction with regards to how we treat the environment around us affects disproportionately uh, the poorest among us. Um, and so what we do in terms of our creation care um, is both got that a uh, part with regards to how we respect the gift that God has given us and worship him rightly by stewarding that well, but also how we love our neighbour um, because what we do um, affects other people in terms of um, uh, both the, the environmental crisis and climate crisis. I think there's one little thing as well, maybe just to uh, to add on to the bottom of that, that comes into this passage as well. You know, I think sometimes our environmentalist impulse is to kind of go back to basics and, you know, it would all be okay if we just didn't have any technology or we just kind of went back to the garden. Um, but Revelation reminds us that, that human destiny is, is not just in a purely naturalistic, back to Eden kind of environment it's we go from a, a garden to a city um, and actually this passage you know invites us maybe we'll get there in the end of uh, this podcast but it, it invites us to think about the wealth of the nation so whether that's the artistry the creativity um, the ingenuity um, all the things that we have learned that in some way what we have gained as human beings and human societies is not going to be ejected, but that's going to be transformed too. So, um, you know, it, looking after what we've been given is also about developing what we've been given uh, and not just jettisoning the whole idea of, of human growth, development and, and ingenuity. So I think there's a specifically Christian contribution, I think, into this debate, which is about accepting and um, celebrating technology and creativity and artistry and art literature and everything else that we as human beings have, have gained. Not for the first time in this series, we've talked about Revelation being a, a vision of hope. It's been a theme of kind of every time you guys have preached, start, you've started off by talking about it being a vision of hope. And I've been reflecting some really, this has been sort of forming in my head in the last few weeks, that we as Christians can often focus on the Gospels, Acts, Romans, even the letters, as the places where we are finding the, how, the guide, the how, how to live, the, the, the thing which is really shaping what our, our faith looks like. And I'm wondering what, I, I suppose, and I'm, I'm not forming this question very well, but if we exclude revelation, then we're missing a massive part, it feels, because we need to understand what our vision of hope is. And if we don't, if, if we live with a set of rules, then it's much, much harder if we're not understanding it in the context of what, of what the future looks like. Yeah, absolutely, Jackie. I mean, I think I'd want to say that the Gospels and the letters do have a forward vision uh, as well, and one that is in harmony with what Revelation says. But I think just very simply um, to say, I think Christian discipleship has something to do with running forward whilst looking backward. And, you know, we look back at what God has done, but we also have to, to look forward. So 
um, it has this kind of bifocal um, element to it, I think, where if we just simply look back, that's wonderful at what God has done, but also there is this um, this vision that, that draws us, you know, it's the image from Hebrews uh, about running a race and keeping our eyes on Christ, the author and finisher. So there's a central part of our discipleship that involves a future vision that calls us on. And I think we kind of know that, that I think in so many ways, our our motivation, particularly when we're up against it, is, um, it, is fueled by what we see. I mean, you guys this morning have come in absolutely freezing um, and uh, unable to get your in. house heated. But, <laughs> Don't rub it in. <laughs> but, but, you're in, but you are enduring for the joy set before you. So you have a vision mm-hmm. of... Uh, of a wonderful property and you're and you're prepared to put up with <laughs> some small yeah. discomforts or some large discomforts for for the vision that you have and and that is a motivation yeah. to get through the project so i think you know we're all at different levels that kind of future vision does does fuel how we manage ourselves in the present yeah i think if i if i frame it better in my head we talked some at the beginning of us doing revelation about how uh, we avoid it or we fear it or we see it as one particular thing like we thought it was a code to you know to be decoded to understand something but actually we we miss the picture altogether if we are not grasping how much of a vision it is for us and how much of a setting before us that exact you know the thing that we are looking forward to the confident hope that we have it it frames it in this complete picture that is so transformational to us. It feels like as Christians, we want to be grasping hold of revelation much more than maybe we have. Maybe that's just me. (laughs) I think particularly as we get to these final chapters of the book, that we uh, need to remember the beginning, as it were, and that it's a letter to seven struggling churches. So it's a letter to all churches in that sense. And the vision of hope and the future that it gives is not kind of like just kind of like a it'll be all right in the end but informs how they are to live together corporately and individually in in the present so one of the 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 challenges that we face and it goes back to kind of like the, the opening question in some respects of how does this in this vision of the new heavens and the new earth inform how we live now um, uh, so it, it's not just kind of like um, uh, grin and bear it um, because there's something better coming but there's something of that future mm. present now you know so yep. again integrating kind of like um, a, a other scripture of um you know, we are new creation. Um, new creation is present in us and the work that the Spirit is doing in us and healing and transforming and and, and, and renewing. Um, so how does that spill out into what we uh, what we do and how we live, how we, we worship, how we interact with Babylon? Um, so it, 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 it all mixes in that. So it's not just uh, something good is coming, grin and bear it but something good is coming and is already present amongst us. So how do we live in anticipation of that? How do we start to live new creation now in the midst of the rubble of the old? Um, Because, I mean, like Paul gave the Thessalonians into trouble for kind of like basically folding their arms and sitting back going, right, we don't need to do anything because Jesus is coming. (laughs) Like, no, I don't think you've quite grasped (laughs) what this is about. Um, so you know there's that there's that real kind of like rubber hits the road what difference does this make for how we're living now kind of question to 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 grapple with a uh, with all of this i i think to you know the living now also involves consolation because you know we face so many losses um and this mm-hmm. is just by way of me thinking I want to get this quote into the whole podcast um, <laughs> but, um, but but actually um, uh, there's a brilliant book by Fleming Rutledge called The Crucifixion and in this uh, book she just cites uh, a little excerpt from the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer so Bonhoeffer 
uh, standing up to the Nazis, um, ended up in prison, and um, his prison letters have been preserved. But really kind of facing a Nazi prison during the Advent uh, season, he was drawn to a Christmas hymn by uh, a, a German uh, hymn writer called Paul Gerhardt. And um, the, the Christmas hymn says, Calm your hearts, dear friends, whatever plagues you, whatever fails you, I will restore it all. And then Bonhoeffer writes, What does that mean? I will restore it all. Nothing is lost. In Christ all things are taken up, preserved albeit in a transfigured form. Christ brings this all back, indeed as God intended, but without being distorted by sin. It's a magnificent, consoling thought, the restoration of all things. No one has been able to express this with such simplicity and childlikeness as Paul Gerhardt in the words he places in the Christ child's mouth, I will restore it all. And I just think, you know, for people who are facing losses, whether that's the, the loss of someone they have loved, dearly or loss of health, loss of memory, loss of position, loss of, of role. You know, we all gain things through life, but we also all lose things through life. And just the, the consolation of God's promise that everything will be not only restored, but more wonderfully recreated and restored in him, I, I think is just, you know, is fuel for the journey. It's... Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, you know, we, we our lives get undermined by by loss, um, you know, and we lose something of our own energy and and passion because of all these these things, which we you know is a rightful thing. But I think just that that promise that there will be a, a restoration of of all things to even greater glory. I think it, it's just such a wonderful, hopeful thought for all of us wherever we're at. Um, whenever we're listening to this this podcast, that I I think you know that sustained a man on death row, um, mm -hmm. in a Nazi prison, and I think it could sustain so many of us if if we really grasp the hold of it. Sorry, but I just wanted to squeeze that one in. I hope that's okay. Well, I don't it, know where you're going with the next question. It, well, I was going to say it leads me very nicely onto my next question because it's exactly where I was going. You started with your three words of hope, and you said, "Look, I am making all things new." And you did a little play on words, which I enjoyed. And you said, he didn't say, I'm making all new things. He said, I'm making all things new. And I wondered, how important is it that we understand this as redemption of all things, as opposed to just throw away, start again? Yeah, I mean, I've, absolutely. Because if, if there's just a disposing of, of everything that exists, you know, what does that even mean at a personal level? Um, if human beings, if it's all new, then who am I in the world to come? I am um, the collection of my experiences. I am the things that I have, have learned, how I have reacted and responded. You know, these are the things that make me me. So if it's a completely new start, what's left of me? And I think one of the things that people are really concerned about is in the new heavens and the new earth, will I be recognizable? You know, will I be self-aware? Will I know people that I have, have known in, in this life? And I think the great promise of this is that there is, there's a continuity, that there is uh, something of our, our nature and character that is, is restored, glorified, uh, and enhanced um, you know, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, um, our mortality or immortality gets put on over our mortality. It's not a replacement, but it is a, a, a transfiguration of, of who we are. So I, I just think that's, that's just a, a wonderful promise for us, um, that this is not a kind of everything stops and we become a completely new creature that has no... Um, continuity with what's gone before but actually who we are becomes enhanced and glorified and has has its own uniqueness and uh, presumably that that is recognizable to other people so I, I i just think there's just so much hope in that idea of continuity for people who have faced memory loss and and dementia and these kinds of things you know there's there's a diminution of the self there's a loss of 
who the person is, but actually the promise is that that will be restored. So the memories lost will be will be restored. So yeah, I I just think when you actually dig into it, the idea of everything being completely new doesn't entirely make theological sense or or personal psychological sense. So how but was there a point in time at which we started to get this wrong? So I think it would be fair to say that modern representations of the end of the world or the modern theological representations of the end of the world are much more, you know, you had to point out in the sermon, as Jack said, are much more, everything's going to be destroyed and then everything's going to be recreated. Is that a modern thing that's just come because of, I don't know, Hollywood? Or no. has, there, has there always been this tendency through church history to lean towards the destruction of everything and the recreation rather than, if you like, the renewing? It's, it's definitely, so the destruction is definitely there in Luther. So it at least goes to the, the 16th century. And, and a lot of Luther's theology is framed by... Um, kind of like a, a eschological imminence of you know he he thought you know um, he was you know living in the midst of Babylon he he dares to name who the the Antichrist is and all that sort of stuff well um, I I'm not entirely sure where it comes my knowledge of kind of like the early church fathers on this isn't kind of like good enough to see with 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 confidence um, exactly when this kind of like um, the the existing creation is is annihilated in a new creation rather than being the the transformation of all things or the renewal of all things is is new creation from nothing as it were of we get put in some kind of like cosmic holding pen while God recreates something or God's in the multiverse, busy kind of like making a new place for us to be or something. I don't, I don't know exactly. Ian might know, but I, um, I, I don't know when that comes in. But it's, it's not, it's not modern in the sense of, you know, it's Hollywood or it comes from kind of like, um, Ian the other week there when he was doing kind of like the views in the millennial kind of like, um, kind of like spoke of a. Uh, Darby and Schofield and, and the dispensationalists. I mean, they amplify it for sure, um, but it's it, it, it pre-exists, um, pre-exists those theological schemes. Yeah, so it wasn't just it's not just a, a result of increased pre-millennial pre. I can't say that it's far too early. Pre-millennialism uh, from Darby and Schofield and the uh, Schofield Bible, etc. No, it it could it. it it could, Richard, be, um, we could put the blame with Peter. So in 2 right. Peter, it says... Um, I, I mean, by three, all means, you ten. can read to put the blame with Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. You know, so the, the language of the end times in Scripture is is pretty dramatic uh, as well and so you know re reading that you know you could imagine this kind of apocalyptic collapse of of all things um but you have to sort of bear that that in mind with with other scriptures that, that talk about the renewal of all things and and the the um it's almost like these kind of two lines that run right through scripture you know one about how the day of the lord will be destructive and and the other one about how the day of the lord will be not only judgment, but will be blessing. So I think it's a kind of thing where you can track that a little bit through scripture. But I think also the other thing is, you know, who knows really what the renewal of all things actually means. You know, I would I would like to think, and this is a bit speculative, but I would like to think that that actually means the renewal of things really from the smallest atomic particle upwards, you know, because there are some things that have been already completely destroyed or lost um and that their renewal would require almost an act of completely new creation um i mean i, I think the bottom line is you know god can do it all <laughs> um how he does it 
you know, is probably beyond my pay grade. Um, but I think it's we, we hold on to the promise, which is the kind of fruit of the process rather than the process itself. So I think, you know, what does renewal of all things mean? Does it mean that it's from a subatomic particle up the way? Um, you know, so I think I think it, in, in my view, you know, God can do it all. It's interesting because when Richard and I moved to this house, is it nine years ago or is it 10 years ago? Oh, um, however long it's ago. A, a day is like a thousand years. <laughs> When we moved here, there was this, it was, you know, there was so much of it that was destroyed and messy. And there was this part of me that was so excited about redeeming it. And, and particularly with the house, we wanted to, to gut the house and to, to make it better. And it felt like this really deeply spiritual thing in my heart um, about something that had been neglected and not loved and looked after. And, and we were going to love it back to life. But in reality, we couldn't save the house because we were not capable. It was not architecturally possible to make that building insulated and to properly, you know, make the foundations good and so on. And it's sad for us that we, in the end, it's the better decision, but we've had to decide to build a new house and knock that one down. But it, it just has made me think redemption is harder <laughs> from a human standpoint. Um, and the more powerful thing that God is doing. It's just a, a small reflection for me this morning. So if in about oh, six months time folk want an illustration, feel free to bring your sledgehammers <laughs> <laughs> to knock down the... <laughs> for a collective demolition <laughs> and we can live revelation together. <laughs> yeah, I think an important point in this though, and, and um, so I was uh, away at the weekend, um, I was somewhere else getting slagged off <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, thank you, Richard, for for putting the podcast out. I was able to listen to Ian on the podcast, um, and I think Ian said, or either Ian said, or I read it somewhere else of, of somebody saying, you know, this isn't Plan B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the new heaven and the the new earth is God's yes and amen to original creation. Um, it's uh, there always was this trajectory from a garden to city garden. Um, there always was this trajectory of God just walking with humankind in the cool of the night to God dwelling with us. Um, so there is the redemptive aspect in that because we messed it up. Um, and that impacted not just um, our relationship with God, but a, as you know, Romans 8 and elsewhere says that the whole of creation enters into this bondage to sin, which God through Christ has, has liberated us uh, from. So the new heavens and the new earth is redemptive, but there was a sense in which it was always in God's plan to, to, to lead us there. We haven't had some Greek for a while on the podcast, but we were introduced to a Greek word, which means, I'm not going to pronounce it, I think it's skin, is it skin? Skin? I would say skinny, possibly. Skinny? But skinny? I think it, skinny, I, I would say. And tell us what it means? It just means tent or tabernacle, um, and so it just it's the the word used in uh, John one fourteen for Christ uh, coming uh, to dwell with us. But it is this this repeating theme which is laid large before us in the actual construction of a tabernacle and then of a temple as a place for God to dwell. So, um, I mean, even backing up from that, there's the whole. Um, thinking throughout the Old Testament that the heavens um, and the earth are actually like a temple. Some people would suggest that Genesis 1, that's another rabbit hole to get down, but that Genesis 1 is a description of God dwelling in a temple with uh, creation and with humanity. So this idea of a place of dwelling um, for the Lord with humanity is, I would suggest, there from page one of the Bible right through to whatever it is, page 1,100 and whatever it is that uh, Revelation 21 is on. So 
it's a really, really strong theme and it expresses this um, passion that God has to be with us, not just simply to do something for us or to stand back from a world that he has created and look at it and observe as a spectator, but actually to get down into the, the realities of human life and to live alongside us, I think as Brody said, walking with the man and the woman in the garden. So it's it's maybe just a little ordinary word, but it is a gateway to um, a whole host of thinking about this wonderful um, idea that God wants to dwell with us and one day will dwell fully with us. I mean, it is a theme, as you say, that's just all through the Bible from beginning to end. What do you think the significance is of God wanting to dwell with us? Maybe that's a bit ethereal, but it's it's such a theme, it's such a desire. I, what do you, I mean, maybe even just from any person, what do you think that's going to be like when it's actually real? Well, I suppose we do just have little glimpses of what that means. Mm. You know, we have these moments when we send something of heaven breaking through and something of God's personality, God's God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, um, just touching our lives. Um, and that's that expression of God wanting to be with us. Not so God's relationship is just not it's not just transactional doesn't just do stuff for us but even what he does for us he does in order that we might be in relationship you know this is the the wonder and the joy of being a christian that it's not just ticking off a few boxes of information um but it's actually about uh, a wonderful personal relationship with god in christ and yeah so there's lots we could say about that but maybe you want to come back I think as well, Richard, to be most fully human is to be in relationship with God and dwell with him. Um, and I'm struck by and kind of like the whole dwelling thing of there's a lot of, I think, the gospel of John um, in this of, you know, that John's kind of like, you know, um, abiding. Um, and I think... I mean, some of this is, is in one sense speculative of, you know, why did God create us in the first place? Um, and kind of like, a, is that a majority view? Certainly a, a persuasive view would be that, that God created us out of the overflow of his love, that he desired to love not just himself, but um, a, another. Um, and so God desires to dwell with us and our desire uh, is purified and renewed so that our desire is for God. Um, I mean, that's kind of like Augustine kind of like talks about sin as being the, um, uh, our desires or our loves having gone wrong that instead of loving God and if we love God rightly then everything else flows from that. That's why he said, you know, love God and do what you want. Because if we're loving God properly, then we're living uh, and our lives and our desires are ordered by his goodness. Um, so if we are not in relationship with God, then we are, we're less than who God intended us to be. We're not fully human. Now, Excuse me for applying the handbrake and taking a sharp left turn, but as a wee aside, verse 17. Now, the, the Bible I'm using is the New American Standard, and it describes the angelic measurements as being yards. I just want to know whether it's meters in anybody else's Bible, or are we being... It, it's cubits in mine. Cubits. We're not being instructed to move away from... To imperial to move towards imperial measurement and away from SI units. It it's a <laughs> it's a sign of a misunderstanding in the translation when it's uh, shifted into contemporary measurements because the measurements are not the point. Yes, the point is actually a reference to measuring <laughs> rather than to measures, uh, and so it is a reference point that is supposed to hark back to to the temple and mm -hmm. a description of what the temple is and it's and it's really intended 
to blow your mind uh, about <laughs> the size yeah. um, than actually than actually work it all out because it's all about um, showing that the presence of God, instead of being limited as it was in the, the temple in the Old Testament, is actually embraceive of all that God has has made or recreated mm. in the new creation. So it's basically saying, and it's it's cubic as well. Um, so it's three. So all dimensions, at least um, those dimensions of height, length, and, and breadth, are covered um, by the presence of God, and and that's that is the point that His presence is now full and all embraceive rather than being limited. So mm. whether it's meters or stadia or pounds, shillings, <laughs> and inches, it's probably a misleading. <laughs> trans- yes. I do like the idea of there being angelic measurements because it suggests that for some reason angels need to measure stuff. I, you know, there's there's some sort of thing going on there. That, yeah, there's there's the, I don't know, there's surveyors. You, you, I think you reference surveying in, in the ceremony. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I love the idea that there are heavenly <laughs> building surveyors <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. because I think building surveyors get such a bad press that so Brody, I'm sure, can come in and, and comment on all of this. But, you know, they're... There are some skills that we kind of think, well, you know, that's maybe that's a not kind of very be heaven. Doubt, uh, yeah, it's not going to be needed in the future. And then you kind of go, well, actually, Revelation twenty one, we've got a building surveyor. We, there's no <laughs> pastors, preachers, teachers, or evangelists, but there's a building yeah, yeah. surveyor. So uh, you know, uh, yeah. the wealth of the to, nations will be brought in. I was a quantity surveyor, and at uni we looked down on the building surveyors. <laughs> <laughs> enough, enough said. But there is there is what a is theological Under civil engineer look boring. Yeah, the, there is. Uh, I wasn't clever enough to be a civil engineer. There is a theological <laughs> point to this as well. Of so, Ian's exactly right. Of do you know what the 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 dimensions of this city are huge, which speaks of of um, God's glory covering the whole earth. Um, but there are also multiples of twelve. So the footprint of the city is is. 12,000 times 12,000, a figure which clearly echoes the 144,000. So this speaks not just of place, but of people. Um, that, that, that we um, a, have been perfected, that we have been glorified, that we are God's dwelling place, that God dwells in us and we dwell in him. Um, uh, that we have been made uh, holy um, uh, uh, as well. So uh, there's a there's a lot going on uh, in what John is doing here. As someone who struggles with the reduction in the amount of hours of sunlight, I was particularly drawn by the no sun or moon required because the lamb is the lamp. Just. A little mind blowing moment. I mean, that's not the first time I've read those verses, but I was just really feeling it on Sunday. No one else. <laughs> Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I think this is just another of these things where we're called back to remember that it is the the Lamb of God that wins the victory and is the is the glory of 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 God's God's presence. You know, human splendor is just not normally regarded as being. You know, a sacrificial lamb is hardly regarded as being the epitome of human splendor. And yet, you know, we would rather it's a kind of victorious general or a, a mighty ruler. But again, you know, we have this this reality that it is the sacrificial lamb that brings the victory and is the splendor and the glory. So, um, yeah, I think that, that kind of struck me that it was the lamb that's the lamp. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, I don't mind there being uh, building surveyors in heaven so long as there's not any building controllers in heaven but that's controversial trying, Richard trying to build a building currently we move on to it is done now it is done is in verse 6 in chapter 21 and obviously well first place I went to was the it is finished of John 1930 Am I supposed to be linking those two things together on the basis that both of these books are written by, in theory, by the same person? Or is it just a, a, a happenstance? 
it's Revelation, so are there any happenstances? In <laughs> I mean, I mean, we already know from Revelation that the, the work of God is completed on the cross and resurrection, uh, and this is the conclusion to what has already begun. I think in terms just of my own reflection on this, I was really thinking more about um, the finishing of what God has started, um, kind of on the day of judgment or the time of, of consummation. So this is kind of giving, as it were, a kind of picture of the final state of things, what's out and, and what's in in the, the coming kingdom. And, and does it equally tie back to Genesis? Does it equally tie back to the creation story in terms of rest? Is it, does it all link together, uh, kind of dwelling, rest, completion? Are we supposed to see the story, if you like, as, well, here's the end, it's finished, here's the, like, the beginning of the end, when it starts, then the kind of, you know, consummation of things in the death of Jesus and then the consummation of all things. Like, draw me a line between those as to, is is this the Bible of Bisek like, trying to tie itself up in a bow? A uh, possibly not. <laughs> Um, I mean, no is an okay answer. I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so. Where I would go with this, and this is where kind of like, um, I, yeah, I'm being slightly controversial. Of not everybody would read it this way, but the the, the crown of creation in the Genesis narrative is is God, um, is is that is the Sabbath day. Um, uh, and here we have the crown of new creation is is God's presence, his Shekinah glory with us of all things being new, made new and all things infused isn't the right word but it's the best word that I can think of all things infused, all things shot through with his glory. So, you know, all these gems and things like that, they're they're translucent. God's glory shines through them, permeates them, reflects, refracts, I can't say that word, refracts and reflects uh, his 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 glory. Um so I think that's, you know, the in the kind of like uh, again in in the, you know, it's finished all God's glory now is all in all. Um, there's nowhere that God's glory isn't manifestly present um, and where God's glory is um, in its fullness, then there is no darkness, there is no sin. So again, that's why there's there's no need for um, sun and, and, and moon because, you know, God's glory is, is that brilliant shining light. So is it the case that there is no sun and moon? Or is it just that there's no need for some things? So it, in yeah. the renewal of all things, do we still have... I know it's maybe a... <laughs> we're maybe delving into territory that is a bit on the speculative uh, range of things. I'm just curious, do we think it's... To touch a bit of what Ian was saying, we've kind of got all the, re all the stuff that is capable of being renewed remains but in its renewed state. But then there's a new physics, if you like, in terms of we don't need these things, but we still have them. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think we're getting into the, the realms of speculation, yes. aren't we? Yes. Um, I think, you know, in the new heavens and the earth, will there be gravity? It uh -huh. looks like there'll be gravity to me, which suggests that, you know, there might be some kind of planets spinning around planets. Um, <laughs> but it is also... It is also it's that whole thing about continuity and change and yeah do we know fully what that continuity will be no do we know the full extent of the change no but we do know that it's going to be perfect in that yeah all that is uh, abusive and immoral about humanity will not enter but all that is good will be uh um, will be renewed and repurposed and um, transposed into uh, a better 
a better place. So I, th so there, it, it's that whole thing. I think again about continuity and change, and when we're in that, I, the whole realm of continuity and change, we're in the realm of mystery. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to emphasise the element of continuity because I think for a lot of people, the idea of everything being consumed uh, is quite scary. Like, and actually hearing that there is the you know that part of God's plan is continuity, albeit a wholly perfect continuity, is actually encouraging and hopeful. It almost sounds more hopeful than just the destruction of everything and the recreation of it all again. So no, I'm glad that we that you delved into that uh, on on Sunday. One of the final things you pointed out on Sunday was the future is multicultural. Now, we're, we've not got a lot of time left, but uh, I just thought, were you particularly desirous of pointing that out because of some of the situations we find ourselves in just now, whereby there is quite a battle of culture and you know the idea of monoculture versus multiculture? versus inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Was there a particular motivation behind pointing that out? Well, I mean, I think I think Brody might refer to this in, in chapter 22. Don't want to write his sermon for him, but it does come up again. I, I'll take any um, help I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, actually, I think one of the strands that runs through Scripture, and particularly the New Testament, that we overlook is is the fact that God's coming kingdom, um, which will embrace all nations, languages, and tongues, is is portrayed and presented to the the watching world through our relationships, and particularly the relationships that cross boundaries, social boundaries. I mean, if you look at without getting into a whole uh, host of issues around what was happening when the gospel was preached and Jews and Gentiles were coming together, I mean that fundamentally was a really profound prophetic witness to a world that really divided people up into uh, different religious groups, particularly the Jews and the Gentiles. So you realise that our interactions now across cultures, across social divides and so on, are, are not meaningless, but they're actually a very powerful part of our witness so i think that's kind of what i want to get across is you know when you when you build relationships across some of those um well the, some of these things that can be divides in in our our world that actually they're portraying the coming kingdom it's not just arbitrary or or nice yeah. or pleasant there's a there's a really powerful prophetic element in reaching out across the divides Cool. Well, we look forward to Brody unpacking that some more this weekend. So there you go, Brody. That's uh, point one for your sermon. Uh, to, <laughs> to make sure you get in there. Uh, we are drawing our look at chapter 21 to a close. So let's uh, go around the doors with our usual uh, chat about something away from what the main topic is. So do we have any cultural recommendations or Thoughts or feelings on anything else going on that is not Revelation 21? Well, you and I have watched the Lockerbie documentary yes. on Sky, yeah. um, which is really interesting to watch because it's something that obviously happened in our, our lifetime, and I was quite young at the time. Um, I mean, not that young, but not an adult is all I'm saying. Mm. <laughs> and I, I just find it so powerful to see the relationships that have come out of that there's a lot, obviously, that's distressing because it's not, it's, well, you know, the suggestion is that justice has not been done in an earthly sense um, and that they don't really still know what happened. But I think what's so powerful about it is the relationships that have come out of that between people in the States and people in Lockerbie, um, the relationships which are now just so strong. They're basically like family, um, which is just extraordinary. Yeah, I know a couple of people that were involved at various levels within uh, that particular uh, disaster. Ian? Um, yeah, I mean, interestingly, I can remember exactly where I was when uh, the Lockerbie bomb 
our plane was was bombed. Um, I was actually flying at the time over a different part of Scotland, so it has a a particular uh, resonance for me because uh, because of that. Um, nothing particularly to um, really mention what I've uh, seen or observed or heard this this week, but maybe just a little bit of a shout out when we're thinking about um, God restoring things and and how we live with things that are lost in um in this season this time um a little shout out for sally magnuson's book where memories go so it's her um story of her mum and her mum's alzheimer's and just some of the things that they found really useful and helpful as a family so just a little shout out for that if that's something that folks are experiencing in their family or friendship circles so sally magnuson where memories go Rudy. Uh, as Ian has said numerous times, of when you're deep in Revelation, you don't have much time for anything else. <laughs> but on, uh, on Tuesday night, I don't even know what day of the week we're on, but on Tuesday night, I went to Kensington Halls and kind of like, is it Milgai or Bear's Den? I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, but I know that I've just offended somebody. To uh, <laughs> listen to to listen to the, the Bartonshire Wind Orchestra's Christmas concert. So that was... Uh, and what I can say is that having been the past few years to the Point Community Choir's concerts, it really helped with the sing-along part because I knew the words and songs. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was that was that was uh, an enjoyable uh, evening. My dad has joined, uh, and he's uh, after my mum died, my dad decided to join a wind band. Um, so oh. that was fun to go and see him and the other band members, and they were very good. I'm sure it was great, but I'm I'm sorry you can't call anything a Christmas concert if it's still November. That should be illegal. <laughs> but, uh, well, they, they 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 did other things. They they did kind of like something from Pirates of the Caribbean and other stuff. Oh, okay. they, they, they didn't just do Christmas ones, cool. but there was some Christmas stuff. stuff in there as well. Good, good. Uh, very quickly from me, I don't. You may or may not be familiar with the name Ian Hersey Alley was involved in writing a book called The Infidel. I, Check out a podcast called The Unheard. I wouldn't normally recommend The Unheard podcast, but check out the episode that she is on. If the name is familiar to you, then the story will be of interest to you. If the name means nothing to you, then just ignore my recommendation entirely and move on and go and do something else. But uh, yeah, check out her appearance on The Unheard podcast. You might find it quite interesting if you know much about her. Good, right, let's get a final thought. Who's going to go first? It's going to be Jack, it's going to be Brody. It's going to be Brody. A final thought of a couple of, so this is turning into book recommendation corner, <laughs> <laughs> of um, picking up on the theme of the renewal of all things and what is our hope as Christians. Um, there's a wee book uh, published by Scripture Union by a guy called David Lawrence called Heaven. It's not the end of the world. Um, it's only, it's under 150 pages. It's a good and simple read. And for somebody or anybody who wants something that's a bit more than my favourite Caribbean uh, theologian, Jai Richard Middleton's A New Heaven and a New Earth, um, which is over 300 pages. So that's a bit of a, a more um, a demanding uh, read in more ways than one. Jack? Yeah. There's so much with Revelation. I find this so hard. And I, I mean, I want to say all of it. I am really the in point two, Ian said that heaven and earth were created for his presence. And obviously I was created for his presence. And is there anything more wonderful? Great. Ian, you preached it. Final word to you. I, I think just to finish in the sense where I finished on Sunday, which is that I was just really struck by the way in which Revelation 21 reminds us that the wealth of the nations that's not a book i'm recommending by the way that the wealth of the <laughs> nations has been is brought into the new heavens and and the new earth and that means that all of our capacities and abilities as as individuals have um have an eternal consequence so maybe just to think to remind people um that whatever it is that God has gifted them to do, to do it with all their heart, mind and strength, 
and to realise that it will be fruitful uh, in eternity. And if they want further conviction about that, um, maybe just a little story that they might want to have a read of is by G.R.R. Tolkien called A Leaf by Niggle, which talks about how his work in the present time had uh, an effect gloriously in eternity. Excellent. Well, we find out all about how this particular story ends this coming Sunday. So tune in to the podcast next week. For the conclusion of the series on Revelation, we made it. We made it together. We started out together and we have finished the the, the sojourn in Revelation. So very look, much looking forward to what Brody has to say this weekend. Other than that, it's goodbye from me and you know, goodbye from those other three people on this podcast. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>